Well, do you have paper scores everywhere? <laughs> You're looking for music and you can't find it. Wish you could get more organized. Well, if you've ever thought about making the switch from paper to digital, you are in the right place. It's your lucky day today. I'm Gloria St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory, and my very special guest today is George Littrest. And he's here today to share a whole bunch of techie stuff with us. Welcome, George. Great to see you. Glad so George is a nationally known music educator. He's a performer. He's a co-author of the Intelligent Music Display app, Superscore, and other software project uh, products that I, in fact, have used myself, which are amazing, and Time Warp Technology. And I think this is about really getting a little deeper into knowing and understanding the techie world. And I think George is about to answer a whole lot of your questions on leaping into the 21st century and making the switch from paper to digital. So I'm really excited to learn more about digital scores from you, George. But first, let's hear a little bit about how you got started with your music lessons. Okay. Um, I started at a young age. My parents were both musicians, my father a church organist, my mother a violinist, and so I think I probably had my first piano lesson around the age of five, um, but during my youth, the, um, the lessons sort of ebbed and flowed. Uh, they weren't um, terribly rigorous. My parents were a little hesitant to push me into a musical career. However, they did expose me to lots and lots of music, and from an early age, I was going to concerts, uh, symphony orchestras, ballets, uh, and so forth. And in um, middle school, I was in the church handbell choir and singing choir and, and so forth. So I didn't actually get terribly serious about my piano studies until college, uh, at which point um, I had an extraordinarily patient teacher. Uh, in some ways, he felt I needed to go back to the beginning to really get over a whole bunch of fundamental technical matters. Yeah. But um, he, he gave me extraordinarily long lessons just out of the goodness of his heart. And I found myself making unexpected progress. And I switched from being a political science major to being a music major and wow. headed into a musical direction. That's amazing. And, you know, I think oftentimes, I mean, we all have our story of beginnings, but in, in right now, how things are just evolving so fast and then keeping up with with what's available to us out there. I have a question for our listeners today. Um, if you are using technology in your studio, just go ahead and uh, share with us in, in, the, uh, in the chat, what are you using in your studio right now and how is it helping you in your teaching? So I see we've had a lot of um, comments already uh, uh, saying, oh, I'm so excited that you're joining us today. Uh, Roy says, I'm not sure, but digital would, would it be like a cheat sheet or how will this help in the aid of teaching? I'm intrigued to say the least. Well, you're about to find out. <laughs> so I guess there weren't any digital stores, uh, scores when you got started, right, George? Oh, not at all. Everything was on paper. Pardon me, sorry? Everything was on paper. Everything was on paper. And so what motivated you to, to get started in this, in this digital world? Well, my wife, um, went before, prior to retirement, was a teacher of the deaf. And in 1984, she decided that we needed a, a family computer and left it to me as the person in charge of technology, I guess, in the household to sort of figure out what we should get. And to make a very long story very short and compact, we ended up getting a Macintosh. And um, I quickly got a little gig for myself writing music software reviews for a magazine called Magazine. And that uh, resulted in lots of companies sending me their software for review, which meant that I had to figure out their software in order to write articles about it. And as we all as teachers probably realize, uh, we really get on top of things when we have to teach it to somebody else. And so I found myself in that role and was quickly acquiring skills. And one thing led to another, and I became a part of the finale development team, which was the first really early um, uh, accessible uh, to a lot of people, a uh, music program for creating scores. Uh, of course, it was oriented towards printing them, but it is a major tool today for um, creating the digital versions, which we use in SuperScore all the time. 
Yeah. Well, that is amazing. I mean, I certainly use finale in uh, always in writing the ultimate music theory books. So I don't, I don't know how, you know, authors wrote all these things before we had this technology. And certainly I've used your, um, your maestro, your classroom maestro extensively in my, in my online courses when I'm teaching. It's, it's an amazing uh, product and I still use it. So I uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so let's talk about what are the differences between paper score and digital score? Well, it really depends a little bit on whose digital score we're talking about. And I'll try to put most of them in one category and what we're doing with super score in another category. Okay. Um, there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of apps that are available on mobile devices that will show music on a screen. And uh, the vast majority of them are displaying PDFs. And a PDF is literally a picture of a page of a paper score. And so we're, in that case, we're just merely transferring uh, a paper image to a an image that appears on a glass surface. And uh, we can do funny things, or not funny things, but fancy things, uh, such as annotate the score with our finger and uh, turn with a foot pedal and stuff like that, which is all uh, very good. In this other category of digital scores is SuperScore and a very few others that uh, have many more levels of actual musical interactivity. So in the case of a SuperScore file, uh, when you're looking at the data on the screen, you're not just looking at a picture of a piece of music, you're looking at a musical score representation based on underlying data that's semantically meaningful. So uh, underneath it all, where there's a quarter note, we know it's a quarter note, where there's a staccato dot, we know it's a staccato. And we do, with that data, remarkable things. Mm -hmm. For one thing, you can put down two fingers on the glass surface and spread them or pinch them and change the size of the music uh, for viewing purposes. And we literally re-engrave the entire score, re-wrapping the measures on the screen, wow. going from three measures from the first system to four or five or two, depending upon the size. And in doing so, we have to reshape slurs that might get broken over systems and avoid collisions and obey all sorts of um, uh, detailed rules of, of music publishing in the process. So we call that in our super score world, our liquid music display technology. I like that. It's, it's much like reading an electronic novel where first time you open it up on your Kindle app or your iBooks app, it's 130 pages. Mm -hmm. But when you make the font size larger to make it easier to read, now it's 180 pages. Story hasn't gotten any longer. There aren't any more words, but obviously the text has been reflowed. Right. And it's a very difficult challenge to do in um, uh, with music. But my partner Frank Weinstock, who's a brilliant musician and programmer, has um, has mastered those areas. Yeah. The other That's thing that we do is it. we we embed musical performances in MIDI format into our most of our scores. And that provides uh, many more levels of interactivity with playback, changing the tempo and so forth. Wow. It's just so interesting. And I mean, when you talk about that, I mean, the intricacies of, of developing that so that we really can find that useful, a useful tool, because you're right. Otherwise, if you, if you needed it to be larger, but now it's messing all of that up, um, it wouldn't be as, as a successful tool for us to use. So congratulations on coming up with all that technology. Uh, uh, it's quite an undertaking. And when you're using this, is there a cost difference between paper versus digital score? Well, in our case, our app, which is available on the iPad, uh, is a free download. So the environment in which you're using the score is free and the app comes with some samples. And then at that point, you purchase scores in the store that's built inside the app. It's much like going to one of the typical websites where we all buy paper music and it gets shipped to us. In this case, the shipping is a download. Right. And um, um, the scores that we sell digitally are priced roughly at the same price as the uh, paper versions, sometimes a little less. But you typically get 
so much more, especially when there's playback and when there are MIDI backing tracks in so many cases with the piano music and the teaching area, um, things that you don't get when you get a piece of paper. Right. And, and so what do I lose when I'm using digital instead of paper? Well, uh, you're lo losing the, um, the dog ears on the paper that will uh, accumulate over time. <laughs> um, I mean, paper is obviously more familiar because we've lived with it ever since we were born, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not finding personally that I'm losing anything that I miss. Um, I do have an active piano studio. And at this point, I would say that 80% of the music my students are learning is in super score. The other 20% is on paper. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that the other 20% is on paper is that those particular pieces aren't yet available in super score. Right, right. And I think sometimes it's, it's nice to engage in both, um, to have options for your students. Um, so I, I think for me, I think it's important that we use SuperScore so that we're we're current with what is available to us. And the odd time you might have an old, you know, piece of music or something you've written yourself that you just want to share. So the dog ear can still work now and then. <laughs> and is there something that I can gain when I'm using the digital score? Well, um, so many different things, and it really depends on what level of music and and so forth. But let me just draw out one example. Um, I started a couple of new students in January and am using the music pathways method with them, something I hadn't used in many years, but had used a long time ago uh, in its paper form. And I found that it was very effective in quickly teaching a very wide reading range. Um, and the, the pedagogues who are behind that method, Marvin Blick and staff and Lynn Freeman Olson and Louise Bianchi were, you know, very brilliant people. Um, well, I'm having a different teaching experience with these students today. I mean, back in the old days, I would have to cross my fingers that during the six days between lessons, uh, my students wouldn't be learning the wrong notes during the week, or that they would in fact be um, rigorously counting out the, the rhythms of their pieces in order to learn the, the right rhythms uh, for the next week. And if they didn't do those things, they would have developed muscular habits that would have to be unlearned and, and so forth. Right. Well, today, the digital version of that um, method has embedded MIDI accompaniments from Paul Sheftel, which really function like a musical metronome. So right from the get-go, they're feeling the pulse, they're hearing the rhythms, they have something to imitate, there's a moving cursor that uh, helps to clarify, oh yeah, that half note does take twice as long as the, the quarter notes. And these students happen to have a digital piano, which isn't required, but because they have one and it can connect to the iPad, they can go into our learning mode in which uh, the program won't go beyond a certain note if they play it incorrectly. So they always come in with perfect rhythm. <laughs> they always come in with the correct notes. Uh, the accompaniments are quite imaginative. They come in with excitement and smiles on their faces. Uh, so many impediments to learning have just plain disappeared. Yeah, I think one of the great things too about using um, the SuperScore is that when you have backing tracks and I mean, we've all had the old metronome, but you can ignore it and just do your own thing. But I find that when you have something like that and you're, and you're actually playing with a backing track, as in anything, if you're playing with a band, you don't you don't slow down, you keep up. And if you miss the note, you just have to maintain your tempo. So I think that part of it is really helping students become true musicians in, you know, you got to stay on point. Um, and perhaps maybe there's a concern that some users may have, and that's what is the real world experience? Like when you're using a digital score in, and I'm talking about turning pages, you know, marking up the score as a teacher. I'm one of those. I love to have my pencil mm -hmm. and, and mark up the score. And maybe what about if, if it's, you know, the batteries running down on the tablet, like what are, what are some of those concerns? Well, uh, let's start with the page turning. Um, in lessons, I do use my Apple Pencil, <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny. I, I use it uh, as my baton. I conduct my students. I use it just to reach over and point to something in the score, um, and I often use it to just turn the pages with a little swipe, and it's 
far less intrusive than my hand. Um, right. And so uh, there are just many things that I, I do with my pencil. Now, if you're a gigging musician, uh, you could just turn your page by reaching up and swiping with a finger. I think that's a little more convenient than actually pulling a piece of paper over. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also use a wireless Bluetooth foot pedal to turn pages in our score. And we do offer either full page turns or half page. And the nice thing about a half page is that you don't have to be panicked about stepping on the pedal to turn the page at just the right moment. Right. When you're playing the last system on the page, you've got all that time to step on the pedal. A wiper comes down. You still see the old page here, but the new page is above. That's and you can move your eyes whenever you want. And then you got a lot of time uh, to find a convenient moment to step on the pedal again and complete the page turn. So it's it's a lot that, easier. Now, the issue of battery, brilliant. Um, I would say this. In my own studio, I'm set up. Um, with a cable right to the iPad on the music desk just to keep it charged because it's being used many hours of the day. Right. If I'm doing a gig, um, I make darn sure <laughs> the thing is charged before I go. And I'm far enough into the iPad experience that I have an old iPad 2 that is just still hanging around, and I take it as a backup. Right. Frankly, I mean, why not? Um, in case my first one went down, which it hasn't, but... I've got my backup. Yeah. Well, that's really fantastic. And I think that's really the key too, because when we're reading music, I think we all read a little different, as you mentioned with the page turn, you know, I may want to read two measures ahead of where I'm actually playing. So just knowing that confidence that if it's just going to bring it up slowly, I don't have to panic about saying, oh, I wasn't done reading that, or I already need the next page. So that's a very, very great tool to have in there. So thank you for that, George. Um, so in, in your experience, do you think my students will be more or less engaged with music, like when they're using a digital score? Well, if they're using a PDF score or one of the other products that's not PDF, but just has a, a rigid display, mm -hmm. um, if there's no playback or interactivity, um, Maybe they will be more interested just because they're fascinated with the iPad. I don't know. But um, in the case of SuperScore, we go much more deeply in terms of the interactive musical experience. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my feeling is this about scores. Ultimately, if you think about it, when you look at any score, whether it's on paper or on a tablet, it takes quite a bit of musical understanding uh, to look at all of those symbols on the page and process it and figure out what the heck is this. Um, now, when the score is something that has a performance embedded in it, mm -hmm. and many of our scores even have performances by the composer herself or himself, right. we now have music that literally leaps off the screen and says, here I am, this is what I sound like, yeah. would you like to engage with me? If you don't understand it just yet, when you heard it the first time, try slowing down the tempo. Right. What do you think about that? Would you like to practice your left hand while I play the right hand for you? Yeah. So all, all of a sudden now the technology can literally draw the player into this musical experience as opposed to, geez, I got to be a pretty smart person and figured all this out and grind out the counting and, and, right. and so forth. So. And so what, what kind of equipment would I need to really use this in my studio? Could I do it on my, on my laptop or would I definitely want to do it on an iPad? Well, currently SuperScore is iPad only. Um, we have an in-house tool um, that actually has the whole code running on the Macintosh. Um, at some point, we plan to be on a whole variety of platforms, but it is iPad only. So at a minimum, you would need an iPad. Anything, any iPad other than the very first model iPad will work with SuperScore. Um, clearly, the larger the iPad you have, uh, the more music at the time you can see, which is a benefit. Right. But uh, particularly for those who have small iPads, if you use them in the horizontal or so-called landscape orientation, you can make the music in our program fairly large size, more like you'd expect in print, right. and you'd be reading 
be equivalent of the top portion or the bottom portion of a nine by 12 piece of paper, which is what music's been traditionally uh, published on. The other thing you would probably want would be to plug a um, little speaker into your iPad to amplify the, the sound, or you possibly use a Bluetooth speaker. And those would be the minimum requirements. Now, if you want extra interactivity, like it follows your tempo when you play or it waits for you to get the right note, that would require some kind of a, a digital or technology equipped piano that can communicate with the iPad. And the neat thing there is, is that just about any technology equipped piano, uh, acoustic or digital, can communicate with the iPad wirelessly. Uh, newer instruments have this thing called Bluetooth MIDI built in. Right. And in the case of older ones, it's just a matter of getting a $50 dongle that you plug into the instrument and all of a sudden it's wirelessly talking to the piano. And there you go. You know, it was interesting. Um, we had our uh, family was performing and uh, they had a rehearsal here. And of course, everyone came in with their gear and set up. And there was, uh, I guess, 15 people in all with 10 singers and five piece band. And I noticed because I was taking some pictures of, you know, the family uh, getting ready to perform. And the uh, bass player had out his large iPad and he did everything on the score. You know, there were, of course, rehearsal and, and he was just changing things and he had his little eraser and moving a measure here or there or whatever he was doing. And I was just like, wow, like he, there was not a piece of paper to be found in that studio. Everybody was just on their iPads and then they just put them in their case and off they went. And I thought, and, and it was so easy because to just get in there and use that tool, um, especially for musicians. And I think when you are able to teach children and or teens or whatever age you're teaching and just get them started using the technology, I mean, it just makes it so easy for them when they're they're performing with their groups or or even in concert. Or um, I, I think maybe one of the questions that I'm wondering about is, do you think that my students will learn faster when using a digital score? I do if it's a, um, a super score file, particularly that has um, a performance in it and um, depending upon their level, MIDI backing tracks. Um, otherwise, if it's just viewing the score on the tablet as opposed to a piece of paper, I don't know that that by itself uh, does anything. Uh, I would want to make a comment though about um, the bass player. Um, I went to a wedding recently and, and there was quite a group there that was performing for the wedding. They all had digital scores. You're increasingly seeing musicians on stage with them. In most cases these days, when you see gigging musicians with a digital score, they typically have a pretty large library in PDF format. Right. And there is a web of uh, music freely in this format. Yes. Um, so when we're talking about just having quick access to a lot of material, I'm not trying to be dismissive otherwise about PDFs. They're, they're extraordinarily helpful. Uh, applications like Fourscore, Pia Score, Next Page are very good in terms of um, letting you set up uh, uh, playlists or set lists where you can go from piece to piece to piece and whatnot. But I do see the PDF format as a, um, um, an interim step between paper and this future world of interactive, flexible um, digital scores, which is where we are with SuperScore. We do have uh, an optional feature you can add to your SuperScore app, which will let you bring PDFs into SuperScore. So you can right. have your PDF library in the same app with your SuperScore library. We don't do all of the fancy things that Fourscore does with PDFs. We just do the basics because we're focused on the, uh, the future. Right. I have, there's a couple of questions here that um, are coming in. So I thought I would just help you uh, address these. Sure. Um, uh, so um, Rex has a question. It says, um, and says, uh, is it similar to organizing your music playback series? Uh, was he referring to a series of yours or? Uh... No, just, I guess he's just talking about when you get into the super score, uh, can you organize the music? Like you can do, you, can you organize yes. a playlist kind of thing? Yes. In our super score terminology, we call it a collection, okay. but yeah, uh, you have purchased a lot of albums from different publishers and so forth. And you want to take 
this piece from Carl Fisher and this piece from Alfred and right. this piece from uh, Cyber Conservatory. And um, my students do this all the time. Every week they, they take the different pieces I've assigned and they make a collection, which is their lesson assignment. Perfect. Uh, when I do a gig, I do that also. And then we put two little buttons in the upper left corner of the screen, which are next file, previous file. And just with a tap of the button, you can go from piece to piece to piece uh, nice. very quickly and easily. Perfect. So the answer to your question, Rex, is yes. <laughs> uh, Jermaine uh, has uh, a comment, I guess it says, uh, hi, everyone. Um, no, oh, not everyone has Apple products. It seems Android laptop and non-Apple devices have limited access to digital music. How would you address that? Mm. Um, well, with difficulty, <laughs> it's something that uh, we're working towards for the future. One of the problems here is that the Android platform uh, just requires a different kind of programming structure called Java, whereas the Apple side and you know Windows as well has worked very well for years with C or C++ and offshoots of those languages. So it is a major, major thing for a developer to have to be on both Android and iOS. Yeah. Um, Apple has provided superior development tools mm -hmm. for um, their platform, which is why I think a larger number of developers have started off on the Apple side as opposed yeah. to the Android side. Well, I think as an educator too, um, you know, sometimes you just have to invest in that technology. I know for myself, just even ha after having this conversation with you, I, I have an iPad that I use an electronic keyboard in addition, you know, to the grand, of course, but I'm thinking uh, maybe it's time for me to invest in a larger iPad because I think it would be such a great teaching tool. The one I have is okay, but now I'm kind of, after having this conversation, it's like, you know what, it's an investment in my teaching studio, just as you would invest in anything else that you were doing in your studio. So um, I think it's a great idea to actually just invest in the in the iPad, whatever size you might want to have in your studio. Um, Jacqueline has a question. She says, it all sounds wonderful, but if the student is always hand-fed learning, I'm concerned about whether or not they are learning to figure it out, rhythm, um, uh, phrase, nuances on their own. So that's an interesting oh. comment. And, and, you know, it's a very good question um, because ultimately as a teacher, I feel that my job is to make myself obsolete in my students' lives. Uh, they need to become their own teacher. Uh, what I'm finding, though, is not that the technology is relieving them from a need to learn. However, it's helping them to learn faster and often in a different um, order, shall we say. Okay. So let's just take the issue of learning a language. Yeah. We don't put a piece of tape over a young child's uh, mouth and prevent them from speaking until they've learned all the rules of grammar, right? Right. Uh, we allow them from the beginning to listen to what's going on in their environment, to imitate, to explore, and so forth. So just to take one brief example here, going back to the music pathways, what I've found has been that in the old days, I would have to uh, really focus hard at the beginning on the issue of what's the difference between a quarter note and a half note, how are we going to count it, how are we going to tap it, go through all sorts of activities to try to get a student to understand that right however now that i'm using this digital version that has playback and these backing tracks they're feeling what those notes are all about right from the start it's a very uh inside the gut kind of uh, visceral experience and they're seeing it because we have a moving cursor so they're feeling it they're seeing it uh, they're hearing it then they're feeling it tactilely as they're playing with their fingers. And so there's pretty deep experience that we can then later set, talk about, well, let's really understand these differences and here's something that doesn't have playback and let's learn how we're going to count this and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm doing the same things that I've always done, but the order is somewhat different. And I'll, I'll make this further point that as I think we all experience as teachers, uh, every student brings um, different strengths and weaknesses as a learner. Some are much more visual, some are more oral, some are more kinesthetic, some are more 
sort of cerebral. They've got to understand uh, the theoretical connections before they can do anything. And um, I feel as though I'm able to bring more modes of communication and interactivity to the situation with my student with these new technologies. And that's just enabling them to, to take off and to maintain sustained uh, interest. Right, right. Um, and, and it's interesting that you said that because I think we, we do want to keep the interest. You know, I speak with a lot of music teachers and they say, oh, you know, students don't want to take music lessons or, or the parents, they're too busy. They have too many other activities. And I think when you provide them with something that's so engaging and so exciting that they actually want to practice because it's cool and they want to learn more. And so I think it's, it's important to provide them with those tools that really get them excited about, about doing something different and something new. Um, one of the questions here uh, from Renee is, can I import files myself? So I guess if you were working on one of your own compositions, can you import that into uh, SuperScore um, so that you can use your own? Well, if you printed the PDF from your Finale or Sibelius or MuseScore environment, you could bring that in. It'll just be a rigid PDF, but you could do that. We do um, uh, work with individual composers and arrangers, and if Renee wanted to be a publisher in SuperScore, that would be a separate conversation that uh, we could have. Um, at some point, we will probably enable it um, end users to bring their own scores in in the format called music xml that can be exported out of finale sibelius and other programs we don't currently do that for the simple reason that so many programs other than finale don't export good quality music xml and you see crazy stuff on the screen and i don't, we don't want people at this stage of the game to think that that's super score messing up when it isn't and um so that's why we've held off on that uh, to this point. And actually, Renny's comment was, can I uh, import XML files? And, and we do get that question. That'll be something we'll allow in the future. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it is the reason that there are too many XML files out there that are just not properly formatted. It's not our fault. We right. read them as they're written. And you may end up with crazy gaps between the staves and misplaced symbols and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we don't want to let anybody see that in our environment. Right. Now, we hear a lot about um, interactivity with digital media. And so are all the digital scores interactive? And, and what does that mean exactly? Sure. Well, they're all interactive to the extent that uh, you can put down two fingers and spread or pinch and change the size. And you can use our annotation tools to mark it up with drawings or apply mu musical symbols from a palette that we have. Um, those scores that have MIDI performances inside them, which is most of them, but not all of them, uh, have additional levels of interactivity in terms of listening to playback, changing the tempo, looping sections, muting parts. Um, and if you're attached to a MIDI keyboard, having the music actually react to you, uh, the performer. Um, I will mention one other thing on the strict notation side of the interactivity. If it's yeah. a score that has multiple parts, like a piano duet or a flute and piano or something like that, we do offer the option to show and hide parts in that score. Oh, nice. So if you're working on a duet, you can see your duet partner's part, or if you want more screen real estate for your own, you can hide your, that part. And we adjust the, the widths of measures and so forth according to... Um, which parts are being shown. Right, and so do, so the question would be, um, then if I was doing a duet, which is cool, would my partner then obviously have their own, their own iPad, correct? Well, um, since we can show both parts on the same screen, you could both read off of the same iPad. Um, you'd be better off with a bigger iPad if you had one in that context or you can put two side by side and you're each responsible for your own page turning. Uh, either way will work. Right. And the nice thing here though is, is that if you've purchased a score that has embedded recordings of those parts, you can practice while listening to the other part when your partner's not present. 
and right. you will be better prepared for the first rehearsal uh, absolutely. accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when now, so I'm going to bring this technology into my studio. I'm going to invest. I'm going to go and purchase the biggest iPad I can find because it's just going to stay in my studio. And so the question would be, do I have to have a digital piano in order to use the digital score? Oh, no, not at all. If you want the program to wait for you on a certain note or to follow your tempo, yes. But okay. for anything else, absolutely not. Okay. And so would you encourage like your own students to, to purchase the app and download um, uh, the score as well so that they have that technology to practice with at home? Or do they just have an opportunity to practice that when they come into your studio? Well, all of my students have an iPad. And um, in the case of one family that didn't, they were well, actually two and a recent adult, um, they were willing to go out and get one. So all of my students have their own iPad and they buy their own music according to what I assign them. Okay. Um, and so, um, and then they bring their own iPads in. I have my iPad here too, uh, but uh, they bring their own in. Oh, that's, so they bring their iPad when they come for their lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they can also put their, their um, collection together, as you said, for their lesson. So that's cool, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So now I know I'm not alone. I'm going to ask you the big question. Right. <laughs> and that's if I'm a little nervous or maybe slow to learn how to use all these new technologies, am I too far behind, you know, to catch up in the world of digital scores? Because sometimes we're, um, and I think learning something new is scary. And sometimes it's, it's scary because we just think it's scary until we actually take the first step and get in there. But but, you know, is it too late for those teachers that have been, you know, teaching for 30 years? <laughs> uh, absolutely not. And uh, a couple points I would want to make. Number one, as a teacher, you are an expert in the subject of learning. <laughs> and, right. and you've been living with yourself for a very long time. So you have some understanding as to how you yourself learn. And um, you can figure out how to take a little time for yourself and... Right. Um, and teach yourself these things. In so doing, I would point out two things. You can take the sort of, quote, adult approach. Uh, well, maybe I'm gonna read the documentation and study it. And we do have documentation inside of SuperScore. The other approach you can take is what your students do, which is, whoa, there's a button here. I'm gonna tap on that and see what that does. And, you know, we as adults frequently forget how much in our lives we learned as a younger person just through fearless experimentation and fascination. And um, doing that on an iPad is, is pretty easy unless you actually decide to experiment with your fists on the glass. <laughs> you're, you're not gonna break anything by just pushing some buttons. Right, exactly. Don't you not? It, and that's sometimes the thing too. I think kids, when you think, well, they learn so much. You know, I remember when I first had my iPhone. I think I, I learned more from my students about how I could do things than uh, because they're just not afraid. Well, kids I was about to say much. here. Imagine that you've got thirty students in your studio. You are actually surrounded by thirty technology experts. Right. <laughs> They all bring different things. And, and you know, I, I had asked you for three tips that you could maybe share with our listeners today. So I thought we'd get started with tip number one, and that was implementing new technology in your studio. Can you share that with us? Oh, sure. Well, first of all, you just got to decide I'm not going to hold back. I'm just going to do it. And um, you just have to realize that by acquiring the technology, you will start to use it. And you've got students around who are uh, eager to, to help you uh, do that. And that really kind of segues into my, my second tip that we had discussed earlier, which is don't hesitate to learn from your students. Right. You're still the expert musician. You are still guiding them in their education, but it's not at all embarrassing to, um, to learn from them. Um, and that goes for the, the parents of the students as well. I'll never forget the moment when I showed the super score for the first time to a young kid who was about eight. The mother was sitting next to him in the lesson, furiously taking notes. But within minutes, the kid had everything figured out and he didn't have to write anything down. He knew exactly what to do. Yeah. Um, but I do have a third tip in this regard, which is um, it's more on the adult level. 
um, find a colleague who can be your technology buddy, who's kind of in the same boat as you, a little uh, intrepid here, um, and you get together and share your experiences, and you'll very quickly find that if you've learned just this little bit about the iPad or about SuperScore, and you share that with your colleague, all of a sudden you're articulating a whole bunch of information you didn't realize you had, and you're just in a different zone because you're now starting to, to teach somebody else <laughs> what you know, and yeah. you realize you know more than you realize, and one thing leads to another very quickly. Yeah. Well, they always say, if you truly want to learn something, teach it. And I think you've really shared with us today that you just need to step outside of your comfort zone if you haven't tried it before and just explore because it this is an incredible resource that is now available and and not only will students learn faster but there really will be more engaged i think um and sometimes just when we always do the same thing that we've always done we kind of get in that rut and i know for myself i'm an avid student i love learning if i haven't learned something new every day i feel like i've wasted a day like i i need to it, it's what feeds me as an educator and certainly i'm about to uh to go and explore uh so my students are thanking you in advance for for making me step outside my comfort zone and say well glory and i'm a junior techie i mean i live in the tech world of course as you know but it, there's always something new, something more to learn. And you can connect and learn more about these resources by connecting with George on his Facebook page, or you can check out the timewarptech.com. I'm actually gonna pop it up on the screen here uh, so you can see it. It's timewarptech.com. So the question is, George. All right. Why, <laughs> why is your company called Time Warp Tech? Okay. Um Music performance literally is a time warping experience. Yes. We get this sense of the regular passing of time, moment to moment, beat to beat, uh, and that provides a framework within which we have melodies and harmonies and so forth. Yet as skilled musicians, we are stretching and squeezing time as we play, either in very small increments or you know, in very large, uh, obvious rubato. Uh, and in our very first um, software product, which was Home Concert Extreme, we set up a situation in which you could have this rigid MIDI file of backing tracks, and yet you could play speeding up and slowing down, and the software would follow you. You could even practice a piano concerto with an orchestra, virtual orchestra, and it would follow you. So it was a real-time time-warping experience. In our super score files, our pedagogical pieces are typically in rigid time, except for maybe a retard at the end. Mm -hmm. But we're also publishing concert level literature now that we call interactive urtext editions, scholarly editions, but with built-in performances by a concert artist. And yes, the metronome settings, you can watch the tempo, it's getting faster, slower, faster, slower, moment by moment, all the way through. Yeah. And we're literally crossing that boundary between the mathematical rigidity with which we notate music mm -hmm. and the human flexibility with which we perform it and experience it. So that's why we call ourselves Time Warp Technologies. <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess as teachers, um, you know, what would you suggest? How are we gonna move forward with, with our studio business plans to achieve our goals? Well, uh, of course, you have to have the technology on hand and, and literally start to use it. And then at that point, it's a question of uh, how you push that information out. I mean, if your studio is um, largely attracting new students by word of mouth, um, your students are going to be talking about the experiences that they're having and the fun that they're having at their lessons this way. And if you're uh, promoting your studio through Facebook and other kinds of um, uh, internet means, um, creating videos of what you're doing um, in which uh, people can see evidence of uh, this exciting and modern way of teaching. Um, I do believe it will attract um, more students. And I'm not suggesting that one should, you know, have a fancy iPad in their studio merely for the purpose of putting a veneer on their work uh, uh, to try to draw in students, but uh, there's substance to it. And you might as well get the bang out of that substance as well on the marketing side, because uh, it will help you to build your studio. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has just been incredible. It's really made me um, think about, you know, maybe teaching things in a new way. It's nice. To, it's, it's kind of perfect timing because, of course, we're thinking about getting back into teaching. We still have got, you know, month of August for some of us that start teaching again in September. It's the perfect time to find your technology buddy. Uh, just step into it and, ex and experiment with it. And I think it motivates us as teachers when we get our hands back on the keys and learn something new and then we're ready to teach it um, you know, to our students when they come in the door. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share these great tips with us. And you are forcing us to leap into the 21st century. Encouraging. <laughs> by, by making a little switch from uh, from paper to digital stores as scores. And remember that you can actually implement technology in your studio. I popped it up there for you. It's timewarptech.com. We even know why it's called Time Warp. Time Warp tech hard to say those three words uh so um any parting words uh for us as we wrap things up george only i'd be delighted to be in in contact with your um your audience they're welcome to reach me through facebook right and, um and we can continue the conversation from that point absolutely and you might even find your your techie um your, your tech buddy uh, somewhere on, on George's Facebook. So absolutely reach out to um, uh, George there. And of course, uh, timeworktech.com and check it out because uh, we just want to have fun teaching and we want to have fun learning. So thank you again for joining me, George. Have a fantastic day, everyone. A real pleasure. Thank you.